Good morning, everybody. Today I'm firing pottery, but this video isn't about how to fire pottery. This video is gonna be about how to go about planning and carrying out an outdoor pottery firing. So we're gonna talk about the kind of places you can go to do this. We're gonna talk about what you need to plan ahead of time and the kind of equipment you need to bring with you. A deep dive on the nuts and bolts of an outdoor pottery firing adventure. If you're ready, let's get started. So the first item I wanna talk about is where you can go. Where in the outdoors can you go to fire pottery? Here in Arizona where I live, there's a lot of public land and that's a great place. Any place like Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management, Arizona State Trust Land, places where people go out and do dispersed camping. That's the kind of places I'm looking for. You can fire in a public campground, but that's not really optimal. A couple of reasons. One, public campgrounds usually require that you keep all fires inside of their metal fire ring. And those fire rings restrict the flow of oxygen a little bit, so that's not really an optimal place to fire. The other reason is campgrounds usually have no firewood available for collecting. It's usually been picked clean by previous campers. So you either have to buy or bring in your own firewood. So these places where people do dispersed camping are really optimal. You might wanna call your local land management agency, Forest Service, BLM, like I said, and, and ask them where people do dispersed camping in your area. The other thing you need to keep in mind when you go out to public land are fire restrictions. So most places in the Western United States are under fire restrictions for some time during the year. Times when you cannot build an open fire outdoors because the fire danger is just too high. So while you're talking to that land management agency, that's one of the questions you're gonna to wanna to ask them is, uh, if fire restrictions are in place, and generally at what times of the year are fire restrictions in place. You can also check online land ownership maps that'll show you where different pieces of public land are so you can figure out what places are near you. Sometimes it helps to do a scouting trip, maybe the day or the week before, just to find some good areas. Now, once you've located a spot where you wanna go fire, you probably wanna plan ahead, figure out what day you're gonna do it, and then get all your supplies and your pottery ready ahead of time, maybe the day before, because you're gonna to wanna to get an early start on that. And the reason is the winds are calmest earlier in the day, so you're better off to get started in the morning and get that firing done before noon, because if you're firing on into the afternoon, you might get more breezes, and that's gonna affect the quality of your pottery firing. In trying to find a good place to fire your pottery, once you get out there, you're looking for a nice wide clearing where there's no burnable vegetation. Here where I live, these dry wash beds are perfect because you got a nice clear area where it's just sand. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of a dry wash bed and therefore you have to look for other areas. Sometimes places where people do this dispersed camping is a good spot because they'll pull their RVs or their vehicles off the road, they'll camp in an area, they'll build a fire ring, and usually they'll trample down that vegetation in a pretty wide area. So that makes a good place too. Other times if you can't find any of these clearings, you just gotta take your shovel out and just start clearing that vegetation yourself so that you have a nice safe place to build your fire. You're generally looking for a clearing of at least 20 to 40 feet in diameter. That way you can build a nice big fire and not worry about it getting away from you. All right, let's start by talking about the must-have tools to take on a pottery firing. Here's my list of must-have tools. That's right, this isn't complicated. All you really need is something to start the fire with. Maybe you're a person that prefers matches. Maybe you like flint and steel. Maybe you like friction fires. Whatever it is, bring whatever you need to start the fire. That's the critical part. Now here where I live, it's easy to get dry tinder and kindling in the wild. But where you live, it might not be the case. So you may need to bring those kind of things with you. I have on occasion brought paper to start a fire with. I have sometimes used lighter fluid to start a fire. Depending on the conditions where you live and how damp it is, you may want to bring those things. I don't usually. Also, if you live in a place that's relatively damp and dry, firewood is hard to come by. You may even bring firewood. And that is something I do not usually do. I usually collect firewood that's really small, small enough to break over my knee or with my foot. So I don't generally even need an ax, although I usually bring one just in case. But you don't have to use small firewood. Small firewood works good for a quick, fast fire. But I've used large firewood. I've used regular split firewood to good effect. The trouble is a fire like that takes longer. It takes longer to burn down to coals. It takes longer to cool down. It just makes for a longer firing as opposed to maybe a firing that's over in an hour. It may take four or five hours to get a firing like that done. So you may want to bring firewood. You may want to bring an ax. You may even bring a chainsaw, depending on the kind of firewood you're finding in your area and how hard that is to cut into usable lengths. Now let's talk about useful, but not required tools. 
Cover sherds are another thing that I sometimes bring, but not always. Not all of my pottery do I fire with cover sherds, uh, but they are sometimes useful, especially if you're trying to avoid fire clouds. Now, you might not use cover sherds. You might use an old metal bucket, or you might use an old flower pot. There's a lot of different things you can use to cover the pottery and protect it from the fuel. Today, I'm using cover sherds to set my pot on, but I'm not gonna use them in the firing. So I've just laid them on the ground and set the pot on top of them. That way the pot doesn't wake up moisture from the damp sand in this wash. A good pair of gloves is another thing that I always bring with me. I use these welding gloves, which are really good because they can stand a lot more heat than typical work gloves. You definitely don't want to bring any gloves like gardening gloves that have some like man-made material on them like acrylic or nylon or something because if you touch a hot pot with anything like that it's going to melt and stick like plasticky glue on your pot. You're going to have a hard time getting that off of there. So definitely all natural materials. Cotton and leather are both actually really good fireproof materials. But welding gloves are the best because they're insulated against heat. The other thing I always bring with me is my infrared thermometer. And that's just how I measure the temperature of the pot. This is a totally unnecessary thing, but it's very nice to have because it's nice to know how hot your pot has gotten, whether or not you need to build the fire up and make it hotter, whether or not it's hot enough and you can start letting it cool down. It's really good and helpful to know how hot your pot has gotten. So that's how I measure the temperature in my firings usually. I also will sometimes use a thermocouple, which does the same thing. It's just that the problem with a thermocouple is you bury that probe in the dirt and you're measuring the temperature at the end of that probe, wherever that is. Whereas with the infrared thermometer, I can go around the fire and hit the pot in various places and kind of get an idea of how hot the pot is on different sides. The thermocouple measures in one place only and that can't be moved during the firing. Another thing I always bring is a shovel. A shovel is good for pulling wood away from the fire. A shovel is good for pulling pots out of the fire without grabbing them with gloves, which can leave dark spots on the pots. So, a shovel is good for a lot of things, but the number one reason I bring a shovel is to put the fire out. Where I live on public land, if you're gonna be building a fire, you're required to have a shovel and some water with you to put the fire out when you're done. And so bringing a shovel is actually a legal obligation here if you're building a fire. Always make sure you take the time to put your fire completely out. Believe me when I tell you starting a wildfire takes all the fun out of a pottery firing. So now I've talked about must have items nice to have items, uh, kind of unnecessary, but you know, generally brought along sort of things, uh, food and drink. You know, I may be out here for hours, so I definitely always bring a drink and usually, you know, something to snack on like a bag of chips or something. Uh, a lot of times I'll bring a lunch if I'm gonna be out here for a while and I know it. Uh, a folding chair is nice so I don't have to sit on the ground. A book to read while you're waiting for the fire to burn down. Uh, these are things that are completely unnecessary, but might make your day in the country a little more enjoyable. If you're looking to up your game in primitive pottery, the best way to do that is to join the Ancient Potters Club. Membership gives you access to all four of my online master classes. But more than that, we meet together over Zoom every week to make pottery, ask questions, and get down to the nitty gritty of primitive pottery making. I'll put the link down in the doobly doo and on the screen so you can check that out if you're interested. All right. Here's my finished pot, came out good. No cracks in it, rings like a bell. Uh, the black organic paint all came out pretty good. The white isn't quite as white as I'd like. It's got a little bit of darkness to it, but it's definitely in the range of what historic Salado Polychrome would have looked like. So I am perfectly happy with this. This is a pot I made for the kiln conference and didn't get a chance to fire because of the rain. So now that you know the logistics of an outdoor pottery firing like this, you probably need to know how to do the actual firing. So I've got a video about how to fire this Salado Polychrome in less than 15 minutes. I'll link that up right over here. So go check that out. And with this video and that one, you'll have everything you need to know to do an outdoor pottery firing out in the wild. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.